engineering and construction. Um, my job mainly is going to be kind of to spread the message of GIS within the southeast region. Uh, and I'm accompanied by Andy Creek here, who is my, my technical resource. So I'll pass over to you to say hello. Thanks. Yep. And I'm Andy Creek. I'm a senior solutions engineer with the AEC sector at Esri. Um, so I, you mentioned kind of the technical role. I am the, someone comes to us and says, I want to do this. How can I do it? Uh, proof of concepts, putting things together, connecting the dots, connecting the points, lines, polygons, making it happen. Um, I spent the better part of the last 20 years in the AEC sector with GIS. Started out working for one of the large AEC firms here in Atlanta. Um, and then mainly around a lot of water and wastewater utility, transportation departments. All well, the top end of 285 here did a lot of the transportation planning work on that. Um, and then went over to the, private, to the public side and managed GIS and survey for the city of Atlanta. Um, and then, you know, after that, joined Esri. So about three years ago, Esri decided to form more of a, a concrete AEC sector. Typically, if you were in the water or wastewater industry or transportation, you would have contacts in that, you know, from that transportation sector or the utility sector. Um, but we realized AEC wasn't getting the attention it needed. Um, we, we do things a little differently. We have projects, we have customers. We're not always the owner operator, but we need to be able to design and build for those, for those customers. Um, and that's what I want to cover today is just, you know, a little change. You may have all have broad uh, backgrounds, different experiences with GIS, and kind of show you what some of the things that we're seeing from our AC customers. Um, we and ways are using ArcGIS. First one is just kind of high level. What is ArcGIS today? What are we looking at? It's not just the 2D maps, uh, paper printouts. Um, it's a fully integrated system, um, integrating with other platforms um, in 2D and 3D. Sorry, I'm still getting used to that mouse. Um, talk to ways, some of the things we're doing now, bringing GIS and BIM together. So we've, you know, different departments sitting side by side. Um, how can we work together, better collaborate, get things done more efficiently and more accurately? And finally, I'll show you our latest release, which came out this fall, which is ArcGIS GeoBIM, which is a cloud to cloud integration between Autodesk and Esri's cloud. Is it not working? No, it's working just fine. Okay. His hearing aid is picking up. Oh, sorry. That's for you guys to ask questions. Is this any better with the, with the window closed? Are you able to hear? It's difficult. These TVs have sound coming out. All right, I will. We're going to turn off these TVs. Sorry about that. Does this help any better? Yes. I'd get them off. Kind of the recording. Okay. I'll try and just be a little bit louder. <coughs> All right. Everybody ready? Okay. Great. So, what is GIS and GIS at Esri? Try to follow the geographic. Is the mouse is jumping me. I'm just gonna do this. Follow the geographic approach. So these are tools we use for better understanding of data. And it starts from data collection and management, ways to visualize and map that data that comes in, analyzing, predicting, understanding and applying that. Um, the big piece there is, you know, actually making that data actionable, beginning ahead of time, getting the action um, analysis and being able to do something with that. And you kind of see the same pattern as we go through. But a lot of this information lately is focused on new ways and new tools that are out there. A lot of CAD, BIM, LiDAR, and reality capture have come into the engineering process. We have better ways to capture 
existing conditions um, and better ways to analyze and share that back out. So one of the ways part of the ArcGIS system does this is interoperability at scale. So this allows us to, instead of taking files and copying them and you know, ending up with data that's going stale, we want to connect and have the ArcGIS tools go to the information. Enterprise integration with asset management systems, work order management systems, if you're thinking about an owner operator, GIS becomes their system of record. 3D visualization and analytics, our world isn't 2D, and we're better able now to model and display and share that information in 3D. Interactive mapping and giving users tools and custom experiences to do their own analysis um, and do some self-exploration and just self-service. Instead of calling someone and saying, I need to see a map of this area, we can just point them to a web browser and have them been able to take care of that themselves. So we're looking for ways to have efficiency there. Uh, big data, advanced spatial analytics, GeoAI and machine learning, being able to going out and collect massive amounts of data quickly and having machines do the processing on that. We're seeing that a lot around imagery. Um, going out and you know, basically putting a 360 camera on your top of your truck, driving up and down the street, um, and being able to bring that back in and have the, the machine learning, the GIOI, pick up things like street signs, get the actual numbers off them, pull, uh, electric poles, what hardware is attached to them, um, without having to send someone out and stop at every single one. We're able to at least get that first pass in and get locations so we can better work later. Um, imagery and remote sensing are really big. Um, applications and ways to share that back out. A lot of this information is really valuable to us as a technical you know, people um, with our software applications, but we need to share that back out to the stakeholders, the shareholders, um, through things like just a simple web browser. We can send them to a URL and we can share that and get more input and information and visualize all those things together. A couple examples of this, just data capture. A lot of LiDAR imagery from drones to fixed wing, Data modeling, being able to bring those 2D you know, real, reality capture in with, with your design, combining the design and the context. And the big one in the bottom right, we're seeing a lot lately, is scan to BIM. So when I, when I worked for the city, we had you know, some facilities, there would be stacks of as-builts. And not a single one of them I would trust. Because um, they both, they all had their version of reality or where their scope ended at that point in time. Um, so we have a lot of places where they want to get that fresh start. Let's go back in. We take in LiDAR, handheld scanners inside facilities, and we're able to scan the pipes, um, pipes, pumps, facilities, and then turn that back into actionable data. Um, just get that, get that fresh start and what is the as-built that we want to work off now. Basically, we can visualize models. Uh, one of the big ones lately has been voxels is a new one, which is kind of small here, you can kind of see it's time enabled. But think volumetric, a way to explore the soils or air. Here it's managing, it's looking at water temperatures, being able to see that over time. So volumetric data, um, not just points, lines, polygons, taking slices through buildings, stripping the structure back to see what the MEP inside looks like. Um, the top one, 5D visualization, where you've got reality capture of a work site. This was in New York. They've put the BIM on top of it, of the bridge design. They've also addition, they put in the scope and schedule and the cost. So they're able to go to any point in time, see what the spend is, see what has been created versus what was planned to be or scheduled to be done at that point in time. And then real-time operations with IoT and sensors within the facilities, being able to show that in a dashboard right next to the facility, just letting the user dig in through a web browser to see what's going on and triggers and alerts. And then, I mentioned this a couple of times, but just it supports sharing and collaboration. We're not locking our information down to our desktop software, what we have stored in our C drive. We're finding ways to interconnect and share that, get more eyes on it, and be able to, to notice and make changes earlier. A lot of citizen collaboration, being able to share maps, those 3D scenes out securely, um, and you know, get their engagement, have them fill out a survey, what do you think of it? We look at this as kind of that virtual, you have a public information open house on a project 
where someone's coming in with the packets of sticky notes and they're putting their comments on things. We're able to do this now through a website and still get that feedback back and then analyze it. And just, I know I keep going, if anybody has a question, feel free to interrupt me. One of the big topics that comes up with our customers lately is sustainability. Our mind typically will go straight to green and green infrastructure, and that is a big part of it. They're asking for designs that take that into account. We're looking for, you know, what are the materials that are gonna be available to us? Um, but it also has a couple other factors. There's the social sustainability. So what does our workforce look like? How are we bringing in our new staff? How are we capturing the information that may be, you know, from running a utility, knowing all that institutional knowledge that's in the engineers or the facility managers head, and are we capturing that and making it available to everyone? Um, and the other part is economic. Um, you've got to be able to keep your business running. Are the processes and workflows that you're doing now, are you, are you going to be able to do them in five or 10 years? Are you looking forward? How are we learning from each other? Um, and how are we, you know, having that full cycle of sustainability? Another big topic that's been coming up lately is just simply digital twins. Um, if I asked each one of you what you thought of it was, I'm gonna get a whole, a, a wide variety of answers. Um, it can be everything from a simple process to trying to model everything that's happening in a, in a city or a facility. Um, Esri's been doing this and been a part of this for the last 50 years. Do things like landscape information, limbs, BIMs, uh, networks, utilities, telecom, road and highways, and all the way out to a city. So we're able to model all these things in GIS at scale, from an ITS box at an intersection all the way out to the entire traffic um, interstate network for a state. Give a couple examples, and hopefully these will be a little easier to see. So this is an example of that scanned BIM where they've gone into a wastewater treatment facility, scanned this facility with LIDAR, and then are able to take that information back in the office and convert that into to, uh, GIS data in 3D with attributes for you know, the valves, the pipe sizes, the materials, and then be able to pump that into something else, a work order management system, or analysis to see age and do work order tracking. The next one we're seeing a lot is oriented imagery. So this is a, our term for it, um, where we have a select, we have LIDAR here, where they've gone in and taken a scan from a drone of a work site. But if you look at our pockets, we've got probably the most powerful camera that we've ever owned sitting in our phone. And people are taking a lot of photos, whether it's a job site. Um, so we're looking at the image as information, not going out to a point and saying, I'm gonna take a picture of a fire hydrant, but taking just a photo of anything. Um, and then being able to click on any spot on the ground and see what photos cover that area, what their view shed was, what could they see, when was it taken, adding that time factor in there and letting users explore that even more. When you combine the two together, it becomes really powerful because now we have the LiDAR that's taking the measurements. Get back. Um, but taking measurements and having the photo with it. So we could do something like that same where I talk about driving up and down the road, getting the signs and the pole heights. If you have LiDAR collected at the same time, you're then allowed to measure how tall that pole is, um, all without sending someone out to take a survey or, or with a laser and try and take an offset on it. This one is from our, our building E on our Redlands campus in California. So while it was under construction, we had drone flights twice a week go out and capture what was actually happening as the construction was happening. They were able to capture, combine that with our BIM data, our Revit model of the building, that had the same phases and uh, disciplines in it, and go back to any point in time and see what had been built versus what was scheduled to be built. Um, and this is something you know very powerful because we can see inside the building that we're never gonna be able to see again in that way. Um, as an owner operator, it gives you that deeper picture into tracking what's going on. I mentioned IoT, monitoring our buildings. We're seeing this through dashboards. So using sensors, room occupancy, water, electrical, temperature, um, and being able to monitor in real time what's going on in the building. So as we're designing these structures, 
being able to track energy usage um, and ways to optimize that and, and better yeah, design buildings in the future. And finally, and I'll go into a little more detail if my hotspot allows me later, Bark GIS GeoBIM. So this is bringing design and context together even more. So here we're able to bring uh, a Revit model in, the Civil 3D, IFC, um, bring it in, put it in into its design space, uh, and be able to go back in and have the cloud to cloud collaboration. So selecting something like an air handler and having the full, uh, here the Revit model from the Autodesk cloud show up um, and that's one application experience. So from the design side, this is a way to show up, you know, what's going on. Our owner operators are seeing this as the virtual file drawer, the big, the big map file drawers we had in the office. They can go and just select a part of the building and see what the original drawing came from that and any other things that may be attached like a instruction manual or a service history or some photos that were taken alongside it. So why do we want to bring uh, GIS and BIM together, which has been a lot of the focus of our team, is we're trying to get uh, both sides of the house to work together well. Um, when I started out, I sat next to the survey department, so I, I got that both sides of uh, working with other teams to, you know, it, throughout different software packages. But, but our customers are being driven by global opportunities uh, and industry and technology trends to bring these together. Once someone sees it, it's pretty hard to not want it. Um, population growth, urbanization, driving demand. Uh, we have infrastructure that needs to support that. And we have most of our infrastructure is aging and needs to be repaired or replaced as well. So there's a lot of demand for, um, for industry and technology. And these designs don't exist in isolation. You know, can we show that building um, and design there? Um, each structure has a place. It's in there, and we want to be able to analyze it better. So our customers who are designing, building, and managing this infrastructure know that this context helps them to be more effective. Uh, they're looking for ways to have access to information about the buildings, like we saw with that, and then the, situ the site where it sits. So existing conditions, what's there, what's under, what am I going to have to deal with? Um, and all of these cases require intersection of CAD, BIM, and GIS. This is our kind of, unfortunately it's not, uh, bringing these th three things together isn't always easy. And this is kind of that project data life cycle where data gets siloed within a department or a task or a team and we build it up and then we're ready for the next phase and maybe our data model isn't exactly what the next team needs. Um, so there's that rework, recreating things that already exist and they can't start till we finish. Um, so you get this big jagged and it's a lot of rework it's a lot of data duplication um, and higher costs. And that's part of that sustainability is, is that's find ways to be more efficient um, and drive those costs down. So by integrating GIS and BIM workflows, we minimize those inefficiencies and information loss, uh, which creates a clearer and more complete picture of a project um, as it progresses. So this is using the right tool for the right job, but making sure that we're all looking at the same information together, no matter what software we're doing to use it. Got to mention our ASC team and projects. So we want to transform the project life cycle. We've always started with understanding the complete workflow of data from you know, something like capital portfolio management, providing services, monitoring enforcement, the BIM data coming in, the preliminary design data, the detailed design, the pre-construction, bringing this all back together, uh, reality capture, sharing what's going on now, um, and how can we share that? The more we do that, the lower the costs are for that change. If we can catch it early before it actually gets built, um, we're gonna save a lot of time and money. And then kind of at that highest level, when we talk about BIM, a lot of our, you know, it's building information modeling. We think of buildings and structures, but it's really the art of building anything. It could be uh, a roadway or a utility, um, but just those actions and then bringing that action from the BIM and the content together. So that co context of the GIS and the content of what we are going to be designing. And this isn't new, um, but within the last few years we've really started working and having a partnership with Autodesk, looking to bring this together um, with the goal of, you know, 
there isn't, it isn't a one versus the other, it's how can we work together through our work, work, uh, different workflows, complementary practices, um, and find ways that we can work smarter and more effectively. So what this looks like is from, you know, it started out with the, what really are the building blocks. So users within Infraworks, Civil 3D, Map 3D on the Autodesk side can connect to ArcGIS Online and ArcGIS Enterprise and bring in that live connection to data. So this isn't me making an export on my desktop and emailing it over to you or jumping in on a, a network drive. It's they're able to directly connect to your internal GIS data, um, as well as data that's put out by other agencies. Many state, local governments put their data out. Um, for one example, is like I can go in instead of having to go to you know, City of Atlanta and asking them for the parcels that are around my project, I can directly connect to their service. And if their change happens in ownership overnight, that's reflected in my drawing. I don't have to go get that copy and I'm, my data is never stale. Um, on the ArcGIS side, ArcGIS Pro, which is our desktop software, can connect to the Autodesk Construction Cloud and BIM 360. Um, we treat them both the same, um, but it's that desktop to cloud connection there. Native, we've always been able to read DWGs, DGNs, um, pretty good on the interoperability piece there. Um, but there's more now with Civil 3D. That data has a lot more rich attributes behind it. Um, it's not just, I'll show, I'll show it a little bit later, it's just not the layer, the color, the line type. Um, we're actually able to get things like sizes and materials um, and complex geometries of, you know, what are the, what are the elevations at the endpoints? Um, and Revit as well, Revit and IFC. IFC opens it up even more with open standards so we can start to bring in other things. We've looked at Plant 3D, um, for people who are doing facilities, um, but IFC is that open standard that allows um, us to see those different categories and disciplines within a model. So this next iteration, I showed this a bit, is ArcGIS GeoBIM, which is, we, we've talked about desktop to cloud um, on both sides, it's cloud to cloud. Uh, and that really is meant to get that information out of the technical staff's hands and being able to share that out through just opening a web browser um, and being having the permissions to view the projects on both sides. So looking at that, um, the project management level or the C-suite or just getting a design out there um, for the owner operator who may not have, you don't want them to have to open up desktop software to operate it. And we do that through what I showed earlier. Um, it's through the web browser experience through an application where you have a 2D map or a 3D scene and the direction, direct connection to the Autodesk construction cloud where they can go through all the document browsers. I can collect a, select a building, um, get that parent Revit model or anything else that's linked to it, sheets, floor plans, everything just with a few clicks. Um, I'm going to try and do this off my hotspot. So you can give me a, we'll see how this goes. Anybody have any questions while I'm? Yeah, I've got. I've just got to move my. Um. I'm good like that. So this is an ArcGIS GeoBIM application from one of our sites. This is in the Highlands Ranch, Colorado. That same building we looked at, um, I'm just gonna draw like this. I can select a feature. And when this pops up, I can see that parent Revit model that it came from. So there's my Civic Center architectural model. I can also see it's been cross-referenced against an MEP model. Um, and from here, launch the in-browser Forge Viewer of that model itself. When we look at the scene, uh, the scene from ArcGIS, we can see that, you know, we can see attributes that came across, categories, structures, um, but we can also do that within the document browser on, I'm just trying to find a surface. There we go. Within the Forge Viewer.
using properties. You know, I can see all the information about the wall I selected. Um, but I mentioned that you can also see all the documents that are associated with that. So that rabbit model is a combination of other things. So different renderings, elevations, 3D views, floor plans, um, anything that's stored with that model. Now if we're thinking kind of more of the, the vertical, you know, this could be, you know, we're looking at um, a building's MEP here, but, we're out, but this could be a wastewater treatment plant um, or anything else where it's been typically hard to display um, complex networks of infrastructure like this in 2D. So 3D is really where this starts to shine. Um, and with the understanding of the different disciplines, I can go in and select all the information by floor. Um, here, I just want to look at that, um, that air handler on the roof so I can turn off the architectural, the structural, and just see the mechanical. When this opens up, we'll take a look at that. You saw that bit when I showed the high, the, uh, the air handler unit and being able to see all those different pieces. So the instruction manual, service manual, product information, um, all available to be viewed in that window. And that's great for facilities. Um, we also have transportation and rail and being able to bring in a rail design from Civil 3D, have it quickly draw um, in, in a web browser uh, and be able to do those same things where we can select items um, and pull up their drawings in 2D, 3D and getting any other additional information that we might need from that. And then this is, you know, we're talking above the surface. I'm gonna close some of this out. Um, but this is also, we're talking about utilities. So here we have a stormwater network, um, gravity network that is, you know, below the surface. Um, be able to get that same information like uh, structure types, pipes, diameters, um, elevations for where that structure, where the input in and out. Um, but having that context of having it all together allows us to see that, you know, when we're designing this new parking garage, there's going to be a conflict with some of the footings here. And we're able to, within GeoBIM, create issues. So in the Autodesk cloud, issues are used kind of like, um, so I can go in here, we have a design change, we have a conflict, we have a clash. I can submit this, assign it to someone, do a root cause, and when I hit submit here, that information gets pushed back over to that designer or that engineer on their drawing so they can see that there's been a conflict and there's something that they need to address. Um, How are you collecting the data when you're asked building these, these, hidden, these subsurface elements? Are you just going point to point like, uh, like the old conventional way of measuring inverts and mm -hmm. holes and where the outlets are? If we are going, yeah, if you're going back into something that's existing, yeah, same thing. Get the, get the, get the rim elevation, get the drop, get the invert, get the number of, uh, if I highlighted one of those again, you'd see the number of pipes, um, pipe sizes, pipe materials, and then calculating the slopes um, and the geometry off this. These actually came in. Um, are you able to go further, like actually as built the full length of the pipe to see if there's any uh, construction defects or settlement that's caused uh, you know, curvatures in the pipe, uh, those types of things. If you're doing something, if you're going in, like maybe thinking like, a, from my experience on side, we did a lot of CCTV work where we go back in, drop the camera down, run the length of the pipe, look for cracks, look for plugs, clogs. Or that's a big type uh, uh, in yeah. instrument and big through it. Yeah, that could be displayed here as well. Um, the oriented imagery I showed earlier where you had the image and the view shed, that works for 360 video as well. So you could see a situation where you'd have a pipeline and you can, you'd actually hi have your defects highlighted based on their distance. Uh, but you could also just click on a pipe, see what the video looked, in that, looked like in that area in you know 360 sphere and then go up and down it. Um, without we had this the old viewer of watching the video but that self-explore and being able to kind of pan around in a pipe um, yeah that's all tied together and, and can be used here how about fiber optic or electrical uh, buried uh, facilities duct banks uh, conduits yep the same there whatever you can trace them with 
because hopefully they've got the wires on them. Um, but we do have a lot of customers, yeah, in the electrical and telecom space. Um, and we've, within, you know, we kind of had this older model of the geometric network where you could run traces, you could run outages, something broke, what's, what's it gonna look like? Um, we've introduced the utility network model, which takes that a level further. So kind of mentioned, you know, the MEP, and it's hard to imagine all that infrastructure in a vertical space stacked on top of each other, it just doesn't make sense. Um, where we can use graphical re representations of a box. Think of it like, a, like an ITS box at a, an intersection. Um, tons of wires in there. We don't have to make all the connections, but we, have to, we know which ones, how they react and how they control other items. So we're trying to make it you know, go all a different scale into a much smaller area. Um, the big towers and, and pieces like that, those are easy to grab um, with helicopters and drones now. Um, and, and model those in real time, even identify them um, without having to physically be out there. Thank you. Yep. Mentioned so that, got this. This is that, you know, same exploratory job site status. A couple other things, but really, yeah, I was ready for you know any questions that you might all might have um, yeah and just kind of see how your maybe how your experiences or any questions you might have regarding GIS and how it fits into modern you know, engineering today um, I'm happy to we're happy to help Mm -hmm. Works for a major tractor manufacturer. Mm -hmm. He's a manufacturing engineer. Works in, uh, in a facility with two buildings. They have a turn. Not at all. Okay. 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 One, One of the people, people in attendance tonight, tonight mm -hmm. is, is a manufacturing, manufacturing engineer, engineer for a major, major tractor manufacturer. They have they multiple have facilities around the, the state, state of Georgia, Georgia. and this particular facility has more than, than one building. building. Mm -hmm. Uh, he oversees engineering of manufacturing process changes. Mm. So would you be able to speak to the specifics of how this might make his job easier? Yes. <laughs> um, I'm just trying to, trying to relate and please, you know, steer me back if I get off track. We see a lot of... I mentioned kind of the owner operator and facilities management. Um, space planning has become big, especially with people coming back to the office. We have projects for navigation indoors. Where, where can you walk? How can I navigate to somewhere? Um, space planning on just, you know, I need to, people may not be coming to the office. There's hoteling. So think of the interactive. But also just yeah, navigation and tracking and safety as well. So with that camera, if you have a facility where there are areas, you know, we've, I'm thinking of the external construction site, we're seeing cameras placed to start to track the movement of where people are going and using the AI to, to pick that up and say flags and little notifications and geofencing. If you're walking into an area you shouldn't be, um, whether it's for safety or you're not permitted there, um, as well as going able to be able to find the systems. So if I got a if I'm facilities management, um, there's a there's a blower or there's an electrical box that I need to go find. How do I get there the most efficiently? What does it look like and how do I how do I pull up that information when I get there? So we're seeing a lot of the indoor mapping and navigation. Um, and that can be done, you know, floor aware. So if you have a multi story building, um, yeah, that's I mean sure there's a bunch of use cases, but without that's, that's really where, in the indoor space, we're seeing, yeah, a lot of navigation, a lot of facilities management. Um, and, and honestly, the imagery in AI is, is getting really big and just being able to, the information they're able to capture from that and at a very low cost. Um, it's just a CCTV camera that's got a, got a con computer that's connected to that feed and, and, and looking for those patterns and tracking them. This is, plant, this is a Plant3D design from a 
natural resources company that's large, um, along with you know some Scandabem and the way they're they're bringing that information together. But that's just this is an enabled through IFC. Was I completely out of, out of the woods with, with utilities and, and transportation? I know you all have varied backgrounds, but um, that's kind of what we saw, and that's, that's what made our engineers happy, was having, giving them the keys to access um, the data on their own terms and in their own ways, um, and them knowing it was accurate, and not having to email us constantly for, for maps and zip files. Um, I had a question. I'm working on a project right now, mm -hmm. which is designing a dis the material handling and the storage system inside a distribution center, okay. about 500,000 square feet. And the way it goes, and the way it's gone, is that I do my initial block design based on some throughput storage requirements and all that stuff. And I submit a block diagram it gets tossed over <laughs> to the architect and yep. the developers to look it tosses it back to me and says well no a column a column base dimensions are going to be x y this i got to modify my block diagram then i got to do a detailed design and invariably that detailed design is not going to be what so there's a lot of back and forth back and forth adjusting and all that stuff where could this software or does this, this tool come in and simplify that process? Because I'm working off of CAD. They're yeah. working off of CAD as well, but they, they are privy to info that I don't see. I yep. Don't, frankly, I don't care. Yep. <laughs> yep. Okay. But I should care, and I do care, because at the end of the day, it's going to come back, right? Yep. So where does this tool fit into the, that workflow, that back and forth, back and forth? A lot, if you're both using CAD, I mean, the, the way on that side, and I'm, I'm just speaking to Autodesk because that's what we've got going here, but that's what their cloud and the collaborate and the projects allow you to do, is to kind of have that feedback and the, the redlining and um, flagging issues. If you need to get outside of the desktop software, that's where this data can be brought in and shared out through through something like a web scene. Um, we're able to show that at scale. So we have a, one of the large, uh, was it the Ohio State? It's got over 100 Revit models. Their entire campus is in Revit. They can explore the whole thing in one web-based scene. Um, so it's the scale there that you, and quickness if you had a user that you maybe didn't want to have them opening up desktop software, where you could create a link and a visualization, show them what it's gonna look like. Sometimes for people, uh, everyone looks at things differently. Some of us are very technical and we like the drawing. Some of us just to say, you know, you've run across the person says, I just need to see it. Um, and being able to visualize it in place, that design and context. Um, but I think a lot of your collaboration is probably going to be more through looking at something like Construction Cloud or BIM 360 and being able to share that design in real time without having to ship it back and forth all the time. Right, because they're... they're um HVAC design, mm -hmm. it's, there's electrical work that I need to look out for. Yep. There are uh, fire hazard requirements yep. and things that I need to work around. But right now, all I have is just a blank sheet. And at this stage, mm -hmm. when, I'm, when I'm doing what I'm doing, it, there are no requirements. Yep. I, I, don't, I don't get to find out until I toss it over. And <laughs> You can't do yep. that, you can't do that, you can't do that, okay, go back. Yeah, Th throwing the dart over the fence and hoping it, <laughs> it, it hits for you. Yeah, and that's, I kind of showed we, uh, we had the structural, you had to bring the disciplines together and bring them together. And maybe if they're, you can, sh with the different permissions, you know, there's different ways you can share without having someone having editing capabilities. Maybe that's where it is too, is if it's converted to GIS, then they're not worried about, you know, you 
modifying their, their record documents and you can show your designs and they can bring your design in. That's, it's the combination and bringing things together might help there too. Um, but yeah, it's, that's the process when I had that big jagged line. That's what we're trying to get because it's just throwing stuff back and forth isn't really efficient. Sources does it need to communicate that back and forth? So both the desktop software is connect to the cloud and that's a different model so if I needed to share something in the past I would have to take my whole drawing put it desktop probably zip it because it's too big to email um, so you're pushing the whole thing out and then that data is dead if I make another change the next day you're not gonna see that um, the data as a service that the cloud enables, you're only querying the changes across. Um, so it's much more lightweight. Um, the reason why we're able to do this is because we're not, if I move my mouse and change the view, it's not querying that database and redrawing everything. It are, it's just grabbing what's gonna change at that point in time. So the data transfer goes down. Um, and with the tracking in the cloud, we can do things like version tracking. Um, see who editor tracking, who made the last edit, what did they edit, down from geometry to a, to a descriptive attribute, um, to different versions on a drawing within the Autodesk side. So if a version's been updated, we get a notification and it only pulls the changes across. Instead of, you know, a 10 gigabyte file coming down, we're just pulling those couple megabytes of what, it, what might have been changed as well. So the idea is that pattern reduces the amount of data that has to go back and forth. Um, between the platforms. Is that, did I answer your question? Is most of that uh, drawing technical information in Autodesk? The one, what I showed today was with the Plant 3D, um, the Civil 3D, and the Revit, um, but that parking garage came in through IFC, which is an industry open standard that allows us to connect to other platforms. Um, so they can take that, it comes back in that same way where you can have the mechanical, the structural, um, electrical, plumbing. Um, that enables us to go even further with, with a lot of these things. And we, we as Esri, we support open standards. Um, try to bring them in. The I3S layers that we're using to support this are an additional open, uh, open standard that can be brought in by other platforms as well. So we're trying to, we have the partnership, make sure we definitely understand those, but we, we need to be able to integrate with, with more um, pieces and when those open standards help there. Did that? Uh, given that there's a lot of data being shared here, Yep. How does data security play into this? You're dealing with a lot of sensitive information where your, mm -hmm. your facility owners are yep. not going to want this information to get into the wrong hands. But you've got to have permissions and protocols in place to be able to share it among the authorized personnel yep. working on a job. So yep. how does all of that work? So on both sides, are you doing? You got it. Yeah. All right. So, when we showed GeoBIM that had the cloud to cloud connection. So both security models are in place at that point in time. What you didn't see was me sign in to my Autodesk credentials when I did that. So in order to see that scene that I originally started with, I have to be part of that ArcGIS Online organization, which is our cloud offering. I have to be also given permissions to view that. Um, and then I can be added additional permissions to edit the data behind the scenes. So we start with secure and you open it up from there. The same part in the Autodesk part, if I had clicked on one of those and I wasn't part of that project, I would have gotten a blank window. I wouldn't be able to see it. So someone's added me to that project, giving me permissions to view those, those, um, those drawings in that folder. And that, you have that kind of granular level on both sides. So I happen to just have all the keys on this project. Um, but another piece that I didn't get a chance to mention on the connector from Civil 3D, um, or we have one for 2D workflows, which is an, an add-in from us, or, or uh, Infraworks. Users within the Autodesk side, if they're given the correct permissions on the Esri side, kind of going that other way, 
they can actually edit GIS data within Civil 3D, um, just like it was native to them. So we hope you can go all the way. You can't go the other way. Um, ArcGIS can't edit data on the Autodesk side, but on Esri side and the JS side, we realize there's workflows that are important where the engineers and designers may need to make those edits um, and have that refreshed. Kind of thing we're thinking like, you've got people in the field collecting data, you're calling them, can you go get me an elevation on this, go get me a shot on this. Um, and as they're doing that, you see the GIS data change in your Civil 3D as you're working. You're not waiting for them to come back in at the end of the day, download it all, let you know they got it done. Um, so you can have that real-time connection there. But it's all permissions-based. Uh, and the best way we see that doing that for everyone is just, if you can tie it into a single sign-on, um, it's one less password to remember. Um, it's one last password to have to reset for someone. Um, and it, 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 that's the big connection because then it also makes the user experience better. They're signing in the same way they unlock their computer. You just have, you have those tied through your IT on both sides. So, yep. I mean, that most of the information will be on a mainframe and you use a laptop or a desktop to access your portion of the information and modify it on the mainframe? You can have it a few different ways. So if I am have, you know, we see this a lot, um, you know, being a US-based company, but we're global. So we have customers who can't have data stored in the cloud. Uh, we also have customers in the federal government who have different requirements there as well on their security. Um, so you can self-host it and it becomes your own cloud. You can put it in Azure or AWS and have it hosted there. And then we have ArcGIS Online, which is our complete just uh, Esri hosted service, software as a service. So from there, you can connect to it from a laptop, your desktop, uh, mobile applications on your phone and, and iPads. We're seeing those become the you know predominant data collection in the field. Because um, you can have a nice big screen, you can have your base maps, you can see everything underneath it, and you can wirelessly connect to an RTK a decimeter grade receiver and be out there collecting data. Um, and then when if you drop your iPad, you're just going to Target or the Apple Store and getting your iPad. You're not having to go out and buy um, a full unit because your receivers just connect. Um, so, and that's part of one of the things, my lessons from you know, survey was using your resources um, wisely. If something just needs to be submeter, collect submeter. If you need you know, survey grade and someone needs to stamp it, send the surveyors out. But I can send my same staff out with that receiver if something doesn't need to be stamped and they can get the same accuracy. It's just knowing what the right tools are for the right data collection. Any other questions? So how training intensive is it? How what? Training intensive. Training intensive. Well, at the desktop level, it's desktop software. When we, and that's where we kind of begin the sharing collaboration and having the web-based you know, focus steps. So if I have a workflow I do all the time, someone can create that for me and we're, you know, our, our lines configure first. Um, we don't want you writing code. We don't want you having to know how to stand up a website um, if we can find ways. And then the web-based experiences should just be that. It should be if you know how to use a mouse and open a browser, it should be pretty intuitive from there. Creating them does take a little more um, some knowledge and some training, but again, they're configure first. So if I showed you how to do one, you could probably do one. The desktop software analysis is the same as learning, you know, if I learned AutoCAD, it's gonna take me, there's a learning curve. I have to understand the what and the why and how things work and then learn my tools. Um, but that's where you would have a GIS staff that could then do that work and then share this out through um, the other parts. But the connections from the desktop software both ways, it's simply just adding a connection. Add a connection, sign in, and you're up and running. Um, that's, we try to, to, to enable more people than just the technical staff. Questions? Yeah. What would be the entry level size project where this type of uh, 
system or service would become cost feasible for the project. Sure. Um, so I guess it's really as customizable as it gets. So if you're the way to think about it when it comes to a price perspective is not the size of the project, but the user. So if you're doing it by yourself, right, and it doesn't matter the size of the project or the scope of the product, it's, it's going to be in the hundred dollar range. If you have a hundred or so employees that are hopping on and logging into this project, that's how it's going to get more expensive. So it really the scalability, if you will, for using it on you know, a really small project to a really large university project, it's really baked into the, the model. So you can do it on anything. It's just a matter of how many people are going to be utilizing the software. That's where it gets kind of the, the price into play. Um, but usability-wise, it can be you know, a single manhole cover, and we can map it out kind of thing. So it can be really anything. Named user um, for the desktop software, there are some more traditional licensing where you could have a licensed server locally, and you may have three licenses, but ten people that use it, so they just, you know, three can log in and use it. The fourth person has to wait. Um, so there's different models for different jobs, but the named user model really helps enable a lot more things with the sign-in and tracking, being able to see who did what, when, and where. Um, that's that's pretty important. Building on that question, and mm -hmm. so this is a type of, uh, of a tool that could be used for um, a, de a design engineer on a small retrofit or upgrade project, uh, providing that the client has data in the form that can be integrated with this. Am I making sense? Yeah. And there, there, there are ways to do it with, with zero cost. Um, if you're, the people you're working with have GIS data and they have ArcGIS Online or Enterprise, which is the self-hosted one, you can sign in through the connectors I talked about in Civil 3D and InfraWorks are free. The add-in's free. You can pull in public data now if it's publicly shared. If you need secured data where you've got to have a login, that's something that they can share with you. Uh, we also see, you know, one of the ways you know, I looked at doing that was filters. So I had my whole big, large water network. But if a contractor was only working on one spot, I could go in, you know, draw a box around what they could see, cut off a bunch of fields they didn't need to see. Um, so I, I did, they just needed to know material and diameter, but they didn't need to know any other, you know, risk ratings or anything else I didn't want to share out there. I could put those filters on it and securely share that with just them. Um, and then they just had to have a, for security, it's just a basic, it's $100 just to be able to view it securely. Um, that's the, that's the, the limit. And can we, you mentioned permissions, you know, viewers a lower level. If I'm an editor or creator creating things, you know, my cost's gonna go up, but I'm also able to do more. Okay, so the, the capacity that you're working in, as you're describing, determining what an individual is able to see for the purposes that he needs it for. Um, putting you in a client environment, um, the, the project owner environment, they've got to have somebody on staff that's fulfilling that role, correct? Yeah. And I'd say 99% of the time they're going to. Um, and working as a consultant or as an AEC, they can invite you into their environments at no cost. You're doing work for them. Um, it gets a little different. We have different ways for if you wanted your, your customer didn't have GIS, didn't have any of these tools, and you wanted to show them this way, we have some ways you can stand up temporary project environments where you can invite them in. Everybody works in the project, and when it's over, you either hand it over um, as a deliverable, and they, and they want to take it and keep it running, or you just kill it. Um, but it's able to be tied to the project cost instead of coming out of your your internal budgeting. Yeah. That's precisely where I'm heading with this. Yep. So, so maybe, maybe afterwards, afterwards I can, I can talk, talk to you about the process for gaining the information where you can actually present it to a client or a yep. project team that you might be subcontracting with. Yeah. 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 
And these are the good things. These are the things to hear. Our, since our team has been around, we're, we're starting to move the needle and say, you know, these are people how people really want to use data. These are real examples, and we're able to bring you all in and um, be able to, you know, the, the product that project delivery piece that I just mentioned didn't exist three years ago. It's just something we realized that people were. They were having to go around security and licensing to be able to do to get their jobs done, and we wanted to provide them a way that's legitimate and can be audited and um, and helps them do it at a, at a very low entry cost. Any other questions, folks? We really appreciate you taking time from your schedule to turn it out here. And Sharing this presentation with us. Chapter one. Okay. Give each one to you. All right. We'll talk about All right. Appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation given at one of the Atlanta Metro Chapter meetings of the Georgia Society of Professional Engineers, an affiliate of the National Society of Professional Engineers. To find out more about us or to join us, check us out at gspe.org.